Okay, thanks, Robin. So I'd like to just uh, welcome everybody to this um, this uh, session. Um, it's uh, dedicated to improved uh, tools for prediction uh, of water futures. Um, and so I'd just like to um, let everybody know that uh, this is tied to the core modeling efforts here at uh, within GWF. So I appreciate all the all the hard work everybody's done um, on the core core modeling side. Um, and uh, just, uh, sorry, I'm just bringing up my notes here. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, Pravin for helping organize this, uh, this session and the previous session that, that Martin chaired yesterday. And as everybody knows, um, Martin and I are, are co-leads on, um, on the core modeling team. So um, just want to acknowledge all that effort and of course, um, I welcome everybody uh, to the talks. Um, the other thing is uh, we should uh, recognize that we're on Treaty 6 land, at least those of us in Saskatoon, um, and I'd like to acknowledge the, that fact. Um, and um, basically, we should probably start the session right away and, and, uh, and move on to the first talk. So. Um, the co-convener on this session is, is Philippe Van Kaplan as well. Um, he'll be joining a bit later because he's been very busy uh, organizing the GWF uh, con uh, conference and he's got a lot of hats he's wearing right now. So I appreciate Philippe's support here um, and uh, we should get started right away. So I would ask the speakers that they, um, uh, they get their talks ready and I'll be starting uh, with the first talk on kind of review of the Canadian National Flood Forecasting Forum. Um, and uh, and we can go from there. So um, I will start sharing my screen right away. Pravin, is there anything you needed to add to um, to this discussion, or are we we good to start? Yeah, we are good to start. Okay. So just give me a second here to share my screen. And I'll put it in presentation mode. Okay, is everybody seeing that? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I just uh, set a bit of context here um, in terms of, of this talk. So um, as everybody's aware, there's there's been a movement in Canada to develop a national uh, flood guidance system um, run through the federal government and through the, the Met Service of Canada. And, and I was heavily involved in, in the, pulling that together over the years. Um, and, uh, and part of that has been kind of developing this community of practice and getting the provinces and territories engaged. And so we had a, a second of a series of two flood forecasting forums in Canada and, um, that occurred recently. So we thought we'd start this conversation by just maybe um, updating folks on, on where things are at in Canada. So we had the, uh, the second annual Canadian Flood Forecasting Forum. It was virtual, obviously, right? And we, we decided we would focus on some of the efforts happening globally with respect to sort of these, these national approaches to dealing with flood forecasting um, and also highlight some of the work done by ECCC and the research community and where we're going in Canada with our national water model, if you'd like. Um, and also highlight some of the advances we're seeing through, uh, through hydrological prediction in, in, within GWF. So the whole idea here was to kind of facilitate discussion between the provincial and territorial governments, their operational uh, groups, and also with, with the, what's happening at the federal level with you know, the national water modeling effort, and then bring, bring the, the global communities into the discussion as well, and also ensure that there's a, a strong GWF sort of research focus as, as part of this. So I think that was a reasonably successful meeting. Just to, to set aside some of the context for this um, in Canada, so um, the, the, the types of numbers we're talking about are, are in billions of dollars in terms of damages uh, in flooding, and that's been particularly acute over the last, let's say, 10 years partly attributable to climate change, partly attributable probably to gentrification and uh, of cities and people moving closer to, um, to uh, flood zones, you know, that kind of, of thing. Um, but obviously the importance of, of, of flood forecasting is, is not lost on anybody. And so there's been a real push federally and nationally um, to move towards um, 
to do something more profound, I guess, with respect to uh, flood forecasting. And so that's been the motivation on the, on the sort of federal side. Damages are usually paid for, um, for major flood events by the federal government. And of course, they'd like to reduce those costs. And so that's been part of the motivation here for, for quite a few years, actually. And of course, climate change um, tends to throw a wrench in the works uh, with, with all this because things are changing as we know. So the, the Canadian and federal efforts, I guess, within ECC was to develop a national water cycle prediction system program. Um, this has been ongoing for at least 15 years within the federal government. Um, and uh, sort of, uh, I guess, recent changes and re recent focuses at the federal level have, have pushed it so that there was funding made available to actually develop a national framework here. So I won't go into too many details, but the system is basically equivalent to what you've seen in the US with the national water model. This is the Canadian version of the national water model. And there's a series of products and services that are made available from that, including things like CAPA, which I'm sure a lot of you have used. And we have, of course, a de deterministic and, uh, and a um, probabilistic approach to uh, producing rainfall forecasts. But we're also looking at producing through the water cycle prediction system in the federal government. Um, actual flow forecasts on the basin. These are not flood forecasts, these are flow forecasts. Um, and uh, and uh, I think it's important to understand that, um, that distinction, right? Because flood forecasting is, is a provincial um, jurisdiction. So this gives you an idea of the landscape in Canada. Um, every province has its own forecasting agency or forecasting center. Um, they really don't take advantage of a lot of the the efforts coming out of the national uh, weather models or the national water model as it's being developed. And so part of this effort here is really to, to ensure that the um, uh, what happens in the provinces and territories, you know, um, has sort of a, a consistent and uh, uh, approach, I guess, and, and uses and takes advantage of what's being done at the federal level, right? So if you look on the right hand side, you'll see um, the modeling approaches are quite sparse, uh, quite diverse, um, and uh, it really is a, a series of bespoke models that are run in the provinces. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's um, it makes it an interesting challenge I think, in Canada to bring everything together. Um, kind of following along those lines, Canada's uh, national water model, if you like, is really following the lead of the U.S. of uh, the U.S. developed a national water model in 2016. Um, and so we, we heard a lot about where they're going with this their next generation of models. And it's actually very consistent with the work we're doing in GWF. So we're very encouraged that the work we're doing in GWF will tie into the Canadian framework at the federal level um, and the provinces and territories will be able to take advantage of it. And at some point, we'll probably move into kind of a North American context with water modeling. And, We'll be surprised if we have similar systems between the US and Canada that are very similar. So some of the key problems and barriers, so we had our workshop, we had a meeting and some of the key issues and barriers that we're seeing are the large differences across the country between jurisdictions. I think I just mentioned that with the bespoke models, uh, challenges in providing ongoing real-time forecasting operations with uh, additional um, resources to conduct the research. So the provinces are typically very small organizations with three, four people. They don't have a lot of time to, to, to take in new data products or, or evaluate them. And so there's a real barrier there. Um, and then, um, you know, one thing that came out was interesting was that there's a shared challenge that uh, in terms of communication of materials to the public, which I think speaks well to the GWF knowledge mobilization folks. And maybe there's efforts we can make there to kind of move those yardsticks forward. So. So this is kind of the message we got from the provinces and territories during the workshop about sort of where, they, where they're finding problems and issues. Um, in terms of using the ECC National Water Mall, again, this was, this was sort of directed towards provinces and territories. Um, capacity to ingest products and services was a problem. So there's a role, I think, for GWF there um, and, and research communities. Um, uh, there's lots of issues with some of the precipitation products and, and there's really a need from the provinces to be able to evaluate some of these products and maybe provide feedback back to organizations like ECCC on the quality of their products. And so um, part of the motivation is to generate a bit of a, a way forward to, to make sure there's communication between the research community, the provinces and territories and those responsible for flood forecasting and the, the, the national entities to, like the federal entities like ECCC to, to make sure that there's kind of a, a feedback loop between the systems. 
but there is overall a positive reception to what ACC is doing and certainly to what GWF has been doing as well. So there was a widespread sort of support of developing a community of practice, which is going to, which is likely going to materialize out of this second workshop. So that's encouraging. Um, and uh, there wants, there really is a need to provide kind of a two-way feedback between uh, the federal agencies and the provincial agencies and maybe develop a national approach and which gets us thinking about where we want to go with the Canada Water Agency. Um, you know, a lot of work in GWF focuses on, on wikis and GitHub and making things um, available and making things consistent. Uh, a lot of great work that you'll hear about later on, on the model agnostic uh, workflows and that kind of thing. And, and so there's clearly a demand for that coming from the provinces as well. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, and then, of course, there's a desire to see advances in modeling uh, make their way into the, the national framework, but also uh, into the local bespoke models that the provinces are using. And, and one sort of common theme that came up at time and time again, and this has been addressed largely by, by people like Carl Eric Lindenschmidt and, and uh, Pravin and others on, on the ice, operational ice jam for, forecasting. So that was a common theme that really came out. Um, and another one was on the assimilation of snow uh, information. Um, and then the third one was really focused on, okay, what are we doing on the seasonal side? So these are sort of common themes that came out of the, the workshop. Um, so very encouraging for us and GWF in that we're actually thinking about all these things and moving these things forward. Um, and the community of practice will really help us kind of move the yardsticks forward. So um, uh, really encouraged by the meeting. Um, I was glad to see so many GWF uh, GWF folks at that meeting and uh, we're sort of plotting the path forward, I guess, from a research perspective with our provincial and federal partners. So I will leave it there. And I think that puts me on time. Um, and so um, are there any quick questions, I guess? Uh, there was one quick question about the uh, slides from the previous meeting, which I answered online. Uh, I don't see any other question at the moment. So we can move to the next presentation. Okay. So I'll stop my share here. And sorry, I got screens all over the place here. So Pravin, can you prompt me on who, who the next speaker is? Because I don't have that up just uh, yet. The next speaker is Louise Arnold, and she has a presentation on quantifying street flow predictability across North America. OK, thanks, Louise. Please go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al and Prabin. Um, sorry, I needed to unmute myself before sharing this again. <laughs> All right. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to present here. Um, I'm Louise Arnau. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, working at the Canmore Cold Water Lab in Martin Clark's team. And uh, I'll present today on the seasonal side of things that Al introduced already. So on uh, quantifying stream flow predictability across North America on sub-seasonal to seasonal timescales. And this is work that I'm uh, closely collaborating on with uh, Andy Wood at NCAR, Vincent Fortin and Vincent Vionnet at ECCC, and then Al as well at the University of Calgary. So a sub-seasonal to seasonal stream flow forecast represent critical operational inputs for many water sectors and for society. I put a few images on the side here uh, for example, hydropower generation, reservoir management, agriculture, uh, and then also, of course, uh, flood early warning and mitigation. Uh, but subseasonal to seasonal hydrological forecast skill is still limited, despite many advances in relevant capabilities. So that includes uh, hydrological modeling, for example, which we're going to hear about a bit more uh, from a few speakers, including Walter. Um, so to build a continental domain forecasting system that has value locally, given these limitations in scale, we first have to understand, quantify, and communicate that stream flow predictability. So the aims of our work here are twofold, really. The first one is to produce North America-wide subseasonal to seasonal hydrological hindcasts. And then based on these hindcasts, we can quantify the subseasonal to seasonal stream flow predictability over the continent. So we're uh, at the moment developing two different workflows for seasonal stream flow forecasting uh, in, in an ensemble context. Uh, and these are the two different images you can see here. So I'll introduce them in a bit more detail now. 
The data-driven workflow is really a benchmark system where we ask ourselves, based on snow water equivalent data, can we make meaningful stream flow predictions across the continent? And so for these, we use uh, at the moment Canada-wide inputs of snow water equivalent data, and this is distributed by ECCC uh, and collected by the many provinces across the country and territories. And I put at the bottom, on the bottom left here, a paper that uh, is very recently online on this uh, new CAMSWI data set. Uh, so it's in review right now and feel free to have a look on ESSD. Um, then another data set used is the streamflow from the WSC HIDAT database. And then based on this, we do some pre-processing of the data. We have to make monthly means, for example, if we want to forecast on monthly time scales. We do some gap filling because there are a lot of gaps in these uh, SWE observations and so on and so forth. And then the fun part begins with the statistical modeling where we run uh, two different models, an ARIMA model that, only, that is only based on historical stream flow observations. So based on past observations, you ask yourself, what will the future stream flow look like? And also an ordinary least square regression model that is based on using the historical snow water equivalent data and based on that tries to forecast what the future stream flow will look like. Uh, and then from these hindcasts, we do some uh, we do some analysis of uh, how good we were. But the workflow I want to focus on uh, today is actually the the process based workflow, uh, and that's one that is adapted from the Sharp forecasting system developed uh, by Andy Wood and team at NCAR, and it is based on hydrological models. So it uses metrological reanalysis as inputs. Uh, we're using at the moment WARF and ERA5. Uh, and then it processes, uh, pre-processes these to uh, ingest them into the models. And then the modeling starts. So we do a calibration of the SUMA hydrological model, followed by a simulation in the past of that model. So we can save states of the model at time steps that we like, at regular time steps in the past. And these will serve as initial conditions for the forecasting in the future. We do the same with the runoff routing that's uh, done using MISI routes. And then based on these, we run uh, hindcasts, ensemble hindcasts that we called ESP or ensemble streamflow prediction. And I'll go into uh, what these look like in more details now. So uh, the ESP hindcasts are produced from an ensemble of historical meteorological observations. Uh, so we use these observations where each year in the past represents a possi possible condition for the future. And so each year is an ensemble member in the ensemble hindcast that you produce. And you start your forecast from these initial states that you saved in the past. So it's one set of initial uh, conditions. And I put an example here of what this would look like for the Boat Benth on the plot on the uh, bottom right. And this is a, an example of an ESP hindcast with 12 ensemble members. Now, if we do the, the reverse kind of uh, mechanism, we can get a reverse ESP. And that's produced with an ensemble of initial conditions. So where each uh, condition from the past, from each year in the past, is used to then produce a forecast in the future. And so here the uncertainty comes from the initial conditions rather than the meteorological forcing. And for the meteorological forcing, we only use the current meteorological observations assumed perfect. Um, and so we can only run these hindcasts in the past because we don't know what the perfect uh, observations will be uh, before they actually happen. So on the bottom right here again, this is an example of what uh, such a hindcast looks like for the Boat Benf. And uh, now for the, the predictability analysis part, we use a method that is called EPB, that stands for endpoint blending. And I put on the bottom right uh, a few links to some literature that describes the method in more detail if you're interested. And so that's a sensitivity analysis that is used to explore the sensitivities of the stream flow scale to errors either in the initial hydrological conditions that I talked about or in the meteorological force things. And so it uses the ESP, reverse ESP hindcast, and the simulation climatology that you ran in the past to calculate your stream flow scale elasticities. What these skill elasticities are is the gradients or the improvements that you can get in your stream flow scale 
either by improving your initial states, so that would be the formula in orange yellow, or by improving your meteorological forcing skill, and that's the one in blue. If your stream flow skill elasticity is positive, then you can expect positive impacts from improving either of these components of your forecasting system on the stream flow skill. If it's zero, no impacts. And if it's negative, you can expect negative impacts on your stream flow skill. And these results are really important because we don't have to guess anymore how to improve our stream flow forecasts, but it can help us instead guide resources for tangible improvements in the, in the stream flow forecast skill. So I'll show you what uh, some of these um, results look like. These are preliminary results for the Boat Banff again, and therefore uh, 12 years of hindcasts produced on the 1st of May of each year in the past with up to six months of lead time. Uh, so that's in days on the x-axis here on this plot. And so you can see the skill elasticities, which I described in yellow, the elasticity of the stream flow skill uh, as a function of the improving the initial conditions of the forecast and in blue as a function of improving the meteorological forcings. And what you can see is that this varies per lead time. So it tells you which component of the forecasting system you should improve to get an improvement in your stream flow skill at what lead time. So you can see that for the first month and a half, maybe your meteorological forcings have more influence on your stream flow skill. And so improving these forcings would lead to better stream flow skill uh, at the end of the day. So you can see that this varies per lead time and uh, time of year as well. And so our idea is really to produce this, uh, these forms of results for a lot of basins across the continent and for different uh, forecast initializations and lead times to see what it looks like. So that uh, concludes my presentation. Um, so to build a continental domain forecasting system that has value locally, we're developing two different workflows, the data-driven data one and a process-based one for North America, and quantifying the stream flow predictability on subseasonal to seasonal timescales. And future work will include upscaling these test beds uh, to the whole of North America. And if you want to ask any questions or chat about these results, you can reach me at the email address I put at the bottom or on Twitter. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Louisa. That was a great talk and she's doing really great work and we're all excited in Canada to have you here and see this move forward, so that's super. Um, so we'll move on to the next talk. So I guess, Chris, you're gonna be the next talk, right? And Chris is gonna talk about simulating multi-scale hydrological processes with the Canadian hydrological model. So Chris, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm Chris Marsh. I'm a postdoc with Global Water Futures at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, and I'm predominantly working under John Pomeroy. So we're we'll talking today about uh, multi-scale hydrological processes with the Canadian hydrological model. Uh, so just in brief, to kind of set what I'm going to talk about, uh, CHM, the Canadian hydrological model, it's a next generation model under development for Global Water Futures. So I'm going to kind of talk about its current status, some forecasting work that I've been doing with it, and then the longer term, putting the hydrology into CHM or putting the H into CHM. So the current motivation, and it's really the motivation that's guided my work to date, is really focusing on high mountains and the models that need to account for the substantial spatial, temporal heterogeneity in the mass and the energy and being able to accurately represent this. Um, Trying to model and simulate and estimate these heterogeneities, it really motivates the use of snowdrift resolving scales. So that's kind of perhaps 0.1 meter to about 200 meter length scales uh, to really get at that horizontal advection uh, that leads to the heterogeneities we observe. <clears throat> and so having a model that can have these heterogeneities in it, when driven with dynamically downscaled climate model data, can really start to provide some crucial and socially relevant uh, information from future mountain hydrology. And then this is really at the local scales that are important to folks. Uh, so using our, so, so, so having a model to use for these types of predictions and going after these explicit heterogeneities really motivates using an explicit distributed model. So that's what the Canadian hydrological model is. Uh, one thing that's a bit unique at how is how, how it represents the surface topography. So instead of using a constant fixed resolution everywhere, such as you'd have with a raster, it uses unstructured triangular meshes. 
and specifically the triangles are sized in a way to best represent the underlying uh, heterogeneities in the landscape. Um, so this can be topography, this could be vegetation, this could be other surface or to a certain extent subsurface characteristics. Um, by having variably sized triangles, it allows you to have uh, heterogeneities and the resolution kind of where you need it. So perhaps along ridge lines, you'll have smaller triangles to capture that really short uh, uh, lens scales you'd observe. And then you can have larger triangles in areas with uh, less heterogeneity. Uh, in addition to this surface representation, it's also bringing a way to uh, have a really flexible model structure that allows for ingesting additional uh, and existing codes. So if you have models that already exist, you can easily bring this in. And what this allows us to do is we kind of rigorously test model hypo hypotheses, quantify uncertainty, do model falsification. And I'll give an example of that later. Uh, LoRa CHM, like I said, it's, it's really focused to date on mountain processes. Um, and so that's not to say it's not applicable elsewhere, but that's kind of where the story starts. So lots of downscaling meteorology routines and accounting for really important processes that we observe, such as slope and aspect, terrain shadowing, uh, mass transports of blowing snow, including sublimation, avalanching, and then of course, uh, snow force interactions such as sublimation, subcanopy, snow melt energetics and interception. So an example of some work uh, where we're going after these snowdrift permitting scales is some work I did with uh, Vincent Vione. So this is modeling about a thousand square kilometers around the Kananaskis Valley, just a subset, which I'm showing here. This is at that snowdrift permitting scale of 50 meters. Um, and the model was run uh, using uh, GEM 2.5 kilometer uh, weather prediction uh, as, as, as its input. And then these model results were compared to snow depths obtained with aerial LIDAR. And then it was also uh, compared with a satellite derived snow persistent index um, with the idea that if we want to apply these to really broad regions, not just these more smaller thousand square kilometers, but we want to apply this to like continental scales, we really need to be relying on some of these satellite indices to be able to gauge whether or not the models are working. And so those persistent indexes just give an idea as to uh, is there snow in this area? Um, so it doesn't give you the depth, but it gives you some of that spatial heterogeneity and a metric to compare. Uh, so I'll, I'll play the animation here um, with, you can see some regions noted in different colors. Really the take home here is if you're not including any type of redistribution, you miss out on a lot of heterogeneity. So on the left figure, uh, there is no blowing snow, uh, no avalanching. So you can just see very homogeneous snow covers. There's a little bit of sublimation loss along the ridge lines, but in general, you overestimate uh, the upper elevations and you miss all that really important mass transport from the high elevations to the low elevations. Uh, in the middle uh, is the result with wind redistribution as well as avalanching. And so you can see we're starting to build up those heterogeneities. We have really windswept locations, creating drifts that then avalanche into the valleys. And then on the right are LIDAR observations of snow depth. So kind of changing tactics a little bit here, the idea of looking to forecast, uh, one of our colleagues, Nick Wayand, who uh, was a postdoc at uh, University of Saskatchewan, he set up this initial idea of snowcast, which I've kind of continued along the way, and it's daily runs of CHM for an area west of Calgary in the Rockies. Um, it uses GEMS 2.5 uh, two-day as well as, uh, sorry, the, yeah, and, and as well as a seven-day forecast to produce uh, SWE as well as snow depth estimates. So the idea with this is we have a way of running CHM on a daily basis in kind of like this quasi-operational format. And the idea is to expand this to Western Canada, to include blowing snow, and then to extend to other GWF international partnerships through like GWEX in our um, such as like the Andes, High Mountain Asia, and uh, really um, short term, the North American Cordillera. So you can see this at snowcast.ca. And in an effort to kind of continue to progress this and expand the domain and have more relevant and more easily interactable uh, data visualization, I've been working on what I'm calling snowcast version two. Uh, so this is moving all the runs from kind of a, a workstation we have closeted away somewhere to uh, the GWF compute infrastructure uh, using a new web UI based uh, leaflet interface. So you can zoom in, you can interact with it, you can see the places that are associated with the forecasts. 
It's also at a much larger domain, about 186,000 square kilometers. Um, and then we have ongoing uh, collaboration with the core visualization team to further improve uh, these visualizations. So you can see that at snowcast.ca slash V2. So longer term, putting this H in the CHM, um, I mean, the, the motivation for the next steps is really that there's interest outside of just the mountain topography. However, uh, you know, the basin such as the Canadian prairies, it, it may not lend themselves well to an explicit spatial representation, such as, you know, you're explicitly representing every small pond, right? I mean, there's some compute limitations here and initial condition limitations that are just going to prevent some of those approaches to be highly successful. So the idea is to be able to incorporate uh, different types of spatial representations, such as HRU, such as triangulations, and then be able to have different aspects of the hydrological system uh, working together that occur at different spatial and temporal scales. So examples of that might be groundwater interacting uh, with wetlands, uh, with soil moisture, glaciers, all these things ha need to be simulated at different spatial resolutions and different temporal scales. So being able to coordinate this together in a larger, broader context is uh, kind of the ongoing and future of CHM. So towards this, to kind of step back and really make the point that CHM is really a model development framework. So it's assembling and operating a model from various building blocks. Um, and a large portion of CHM is just actually coordinating that flow of information. So as a result, CHM really is a hub and spoke coupler. So you have all these components, perhaps a snow model, a canopy model that are all interacting together. And it's been really good, but it's because I, I'm not able to expand it different uh, spatial representations and really link the different temporal scales, it's a bit limiting. So we need to take and improve that. Um, so that's this idea of a hierarchical coupler. And so the idea here is to really be able to uh, have different levels of process representation. So to be able to have kind of like a do it all representation. So for example, canopy model, uh, be able to have more explicit choices about sub process representation in that and then be able to take that to something more uh, complex, perhaps um, at the flux parameterization level and be able to orchestrate different models and different sub-process representations with different amounts of black boxedness working together and linking those. And so if you come in and say, I have a canopy model that I'm very happy with and I can want to work with that, that's something that can fit and slot into uh, perhaps a per flux uh, decision snow melt model. So to do this, uh, this hierarchical coupler is really going to take some new novel approaches. So to set the context for this, uh, for this, to be able to handle this, all of the numerics for the solutions of these flux parameterizations will be optionally within a coupler. So what this allows us to do, and I'm just going to go top to bottom in this diagram, is be able to take our building blocks, and this will just start with a, perhaps a SUMA canopy model that's at a flux parameterization level. The coupler then has the state equations that correspond and then does the numerical solution. It can then coordinate this with perhaps Snowbell, Snowbell um, a snowpack model. Now this is an existing model that's been ingested into CHM and it handles its own numerics. And so in this case, the coupler only needs to coordinate the flux and the states and doesn't need to do uh, the numerical solution. And then you can start building this up and inserting these couplers at multiple locations to be able to build up that more broad model. And perhaps here, the dotted dashed lines here represent more of that surface representation. Could then, then through the coupler, be able to orchestrate a different spatial and temporal um, uh, resolutions for, let's say, a glacier model. And by having the numerics in the coupler, it's really going to kind of enable an unprecedented flexibility and numerical performance and error control in our solutions. So just bring this together in summary here. So CHM is multi-scale representative snow process in the mountains and the inclusions of snow redistribution by blowing snow and avalanching is critical. I'm um, gonna bring this to Snowcast to provide kind of a quasi operational snow depth and sweep forecast that includes blowing snow for large uh, spatial domains at a high spatial resolution. And this is really enabled through ongoing high performance computing improvements. And then going forward, uh, work in progress has SUMA within CHM for the hydrology and um, taking that to that next step for including more of the hydrological processes. So that's everything. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris, for that. And, and very exciting work for sure. Um, and just to keep our water quality colleagues engaged, this actually does 
<laughs> have a, a downstream effect, right? And so, so uh, Walter will talk next about uh, efficient and reproducible earth systems model. So we're now sort of narrowing it down into the water quality categories. And you'll hear later on from, from Luca about some temperature modeling and some um, water quality modeling next generation as well. So these do all tie together. I just want to make sure water quality colleagues are comfortable with the conversations here. Um, and so we can move on. And I think, I think the next talk will actually really kind of brings a bunch of things together in, in terms of how we we need to create uh, efficient and reproducible uh, earth system models um, for a variety of purposes. And so, uh, Walter, the, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks, Al. Um, I think that's an, uh, that's an excellent way to describe this, wor uh, this work. We've, uh, we've heard about the, the model internal dynamics from Chris. We've heard about what you can do with the outputs uh, by Louise. My work is more about how you actually get the inputs uh, for your models in a way that is uh, both efficient, but also reproducible. So this is a collaboration uh, between a bunch of different institutes. Um, and special thanks goes out to the Compi core team who have actually been uh, using my code and pointing out a ton of tiny things that will make life better for everyone. So to start with, um, what are workflows and why do we need them? Um, so typical modeling studies um, in uh, computational hydrology, at least, have a bit of a reproducibility issue in the sense that um, these results, you typically need to take them at face value because they cannot easily be reproduced. Uh, someone has um, investigated this recently and they estimate that between uh, one in 200 or one in 20 uh, of all modeling studies are reproducible. So that is, that is horribly low, that's a really low number. And what that means is that we are essentially doing something what I call faith-based science, uh, is where we take um, results shown to us in papers at face value because we have no way to check whether these are true. Um, now, reproducibility, of course, is a cornerstone of science. So uh, making our science more reproducible is something that we really should be striving for. Um, what we've been doing here is create workflows. And workflows are collections of computer codes uh, needed to configure these models that we run across these large domains. Now, why are these good? Uh, because they make the, the whole model setup more transparent, they make it reproducible, and they make it quicker. Um, and this is good scientific practice because it allows others to actually redo our work and see if we've made any mistakes, see if they can reproduce our conclusions, and that builds faith in what we say. Um, it's easier to keep track of the work that's being done. It makes revisions more efficient. It makes collaborations easier, and uh, especially in a group like Compi Core, where there's a lot of um, there's a lot of different people doing different things, but uh, the internal models are are quite similar. Um, these efficiency gains can be quite large. So what I'll be showing in this talk is an example of uh, of the workflow that I've uh, set up for large domain earth system modeling using uh, the SUMA model as the Earth system model of choice and using Mizu routes as the routing model that we, uh, that we connect to, to SUMA. So this is a bit of a sketch of how the data flows in these models work. Uh, so we've got some input data that is converted into model setting files. And then we've got some model source codes. These give us simulations. And finally, we do some analysis on these, on these uh, simulations. Now, if we look at... Um, what's actually specific to these models in this entire workflow, that's this dark gray area here. So these models are, are pretty uh, particular about how they want their inputs, uh, what these inputs should be. Um, but despite the large number of, of uh, blocks in this dark gray area, uh, a lot of the model setup time is actually spent in this light gray area, which is data downloads, data pre-processing, uh, converting, um, possibly outdated satellite uh, data formats into, into these newer formats that current generation models actually use. And it's not uncommon to hear people say that about 80% of time is spent on model setup, leaving only 20% uh, of the time to do science. And ideally, we would want to have that at least the other way around. So what we've been doing here is, um, this is my overview of what is needed to get a basic SUMA and MISORAD setup uh, running. Um, We'll, we'll zoom in on a, on a part of this later, so don't worry that these boxes are not super readable. But what we've been doing here is divide these tasks into uh, things that are really specific to the models. So these are the generation of the, the, the particular input files that the models need. 
and tasks that are that are more model agnostic. So that would be the light gray stuff uh, up top. Um, and model agnostic tasks, uh, they do not actually depend on the model being used. And thus any code that does these, these uh, steps in light gray can theoretically be shared by uh, beyond the SUMA user group. So this could be quite useful for people who uh, are running, uh, I don't know, Vic, Mesh, any other uh, type of model that you're actually interested in. So looking in a bit more detail, uh, we'll zoom in on these model agnostic steps just to have a bit of a look. Um, and this is what we're dealing with here. So this is mostly data preparation. Um, these models, they need some form of forcing data, which needs to be downloaded, possibly merged if the file sources are uh, come from different sources. Uh, they need some geospatial parameter fields. There's elevation data like a DEM, uh, land classes, uh, soil classes, that kind of stuff. Um, there's often a geospatial step in between where we map um, the source data at its native resolution onto the model elements that we want to use. So this could be um, rescaling grids, but also mapping gridded data into uh, catchment areas. Um, and these steps, they can be quite time consuming. And especially if you're a novice modeler, never having worked with these types of models before, this can be really confusing. Um, so what, what we've been trying to do is make sure that the code that we have here is, is quite straightforward, um, that it's very modular, that every step has its own bit of code, has, has its own inputs and outputs, just to make sure that this is very easy to use and very easy to expand beyond the test case that I'm showing here. Um, obviously, ideally, this will become a community effort where it's not just me um, making this code, but we let this code out into the wider world and it can be used and expanded on by others. Now, the scope of my example implementation is uh, it does not include domain discretization and it does not include parameter calibration uh, because both of these are very active scientific fields and including up-to-date and relevant methods for all the purposes that people could possibly have in this single workflow is in my opinion, not feasible. So what this workflow example really focuses on are the steps that are commonly not really mentioned in the literature and that's the, 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 the data pre-processing. So what we expect to do is users have their own shapefiles of the domain they want to work with and the river network that connects the model elements. And then uh, the workflow goes through and it downloads, uh, it downloads forcing data, it does uh, geospatial parameter pre-processing, it creates all the input files that the models need, it runs the simulation and it does some, some basic um, post-processing of outputs and that gives you something like this. Um, data goes in, simulations come out, excellent. This code is all stored in GitHub, um, and that has a real benefit in terms of reproducibility because the modeling setup that I showed on the previous slide that contains several terabytes worth of data. Sharing that data is completely infeasible. Uh, so instead we share the code that generates the data. Um, it's way more space efficient and it allows people to redo our work. It also allows active development, and I'm not sure if you can see, but there's an issues tab here on, uh, on GitHub and that number is not zero meaning that people are actually using my work and uh, pointing out where it can be made better. Now, one of the key principles that we've used here is to really cleanly separate the code on the one hand that generates data and the folders where the data goes in on the other hand. This makes it quite easy even for novice users to see what goes where and it prevents, it prevents issues where um, data and code get mixed, get mixed up. This is, this is much more clean. And we set things up in a way that um, if you want to generate a basic modeling setup, all you need to do is uh, modify a, a single text file. That's uh, what we call a control file. And this contains information about your shape files, information about where the data needs to go, the uh, temporal and spatial resolution of your domain, uh, and a bunch of other things. And it means that if you update this single script and run through the entire workflow, you don't actually need to change any of the code and it will, it will get the information it needs from this particular control file and it will put the new data where you want it. Um, and this just means that the work is really traceable, it's efficient and we're now at a stage we're setting up um, a new SUMA plus Miseroute instantiation for uh, the BOAT band, for example, it takes about 24 hours, which is, uh, which is a lot faster than how long it took me to get to that particular stage. There are bottlenecks, data downloads can take, can take a little while. Um, data processing obviously takes longer when the domain becomes larger, um, but these are, these are things that you have to go through anyway. 
And uh, with workflows such, such as this, there's less time spent on actually creating the code, uh, which is a big win. Now we're currently crash testing this uh, across uh, all of North America. So we're talking about maybe a half a million modeling elements here. And uh, this just shows a nice overview of that domain. Um, if there's any questions, uh, if you want to try this out yourself, feel free to get in touch. And thank you. Great, thanks, Walter. That's that's really lovely, and and you know ties into the actually the first talk about this community of practice, right? Which is really where this is going to have a lot of meaning down the road, and of course the the idea of, of making sure things are repeatable is is a huge issue in science, and so uh, that's that's great work, and looking forward to the to all of this. Our next speaker will be um, focusing. Uh, moving more into the riverine uh, aspects and looking at stream temperature. Um, so, and, and Luca, I think you're still in Italy, so it's probably late for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's evening. Appreciate, appreciate um, you hanging out here. So, uh, uh, Luca, the, uh, yeah, the, floor is, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, I'm sharing the screen. Can you see it? Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, so my um, so my presentation talks about uh, the sensitivity of stream temperature models to um, hydrological model configurations, meaning hydrological model parameters. So we have that uh, deterministic stream temperature models are generally coupled with hydrological models from which they get basically the hydrological inputs they need to calculate the the heat balance for the stream. However, despite the well-known uncertainty for the hydrological model parameters, only a single hydrological model configurations is generally considered to force the stream temperature model. Therefore, in my presentation, in this work, what we try to do is to, at least quali qualitatively, assess the sensitivity of uh, stream temperature models to hydrological model configurations and to compare it with the impact that, uh, of uh, stream temperature model parameters and see. And basically what we want to see is if using a single hydrological model configuration to force a stream temperature model is a justifiable approach or not. So the study site is the Grand River watershed, which is the largest watershed in southwestern Ontario. It has an area of about 700 square kilometer, precipitation about annual precipitation about a meter, one meter, and average air temperature five six degrees. The land use is mainly agriculture, and it's a highly highly regulated catchment with several dams for flood control and power production. The study period uh, spanned from 2005 to 2012, and first four years are for calibration, second four years for model validation. So in this study, we couple uh, the hydrological model mesh with um, the stream temperature model RBM to simulate the hydrological and stream thermal cycles. Why did we choose these two models? First, because they have been both widely used and successfully used in medium and large scale studies. Second, because they are both gridded models and that makes easier the coupling process. So a brief introduction about MESH. MESH uh, couples uh, combines the land surface scheme class with the river routing system contained in what flood Inputs are uh, meteorological factor grid. Uh, we have global parameters and parameters that varies with, uh, especially with land use and soil and soil type. Main output are daily stream flow in channel hydraulics and groundwater contribution that are used to force the, the stream temperature model. <clears throat> model calibration uh, was done against four sites distributed along the main stem. We consider three objective functions, looking at different aspects of the hydrograph. And uh, we basically derived three scenarios, hydrological scenarios, 
uh, hydrological configuration, sorry. Uh, each one maximizing one of the, these three uh, objective function. And um, if you think of that as a, like kind of a, a Pareto front, this would be like the three at the, the three extreme models. Um, the, there are 44 parameters to calibrate it, and we use the DDS algorithm with the 30 hundred simulations in total. These are the, the results we have uh, for the for mesh. We have uh, kind of uh, results in line with the other hydrological studies in the Grand River watershed. And uh, as you can see, the three configurations, which are the three lines, uh, green, red, and, and blue, uh, they have like very different uh, like stream flow, and uh, the difference is not only in the magnitude, in the magnitude as you see here, but also in the um, uh, contribution of different area to the in different proportion to the to the stream flow. And so we will use these three, three configurations to force the stream temperature model. Uh, brief introduction now for the stream temperature model. Uh, RBM is a one-dimensional di stream temperature model that uses a semi Lagrangian numerical scheme. Main inputs include hydrological data, in this case, daily data at, at um, five, five kilometers grid, and uh, other hydrological data that comes from, uh, from mesh. Output are daily stream temperature. Model calibration uh, was done comparing the simulations to observation in six sites. Mean absolute error was used as a metric for calibration, and although other metrics were considered just to, for comparison with other studies. Uh, nine parameters in total were calibrated using a Monte Carlo approach and a total of 1,500 simulations, basically. Uh, 500 for each hydrological model configurations. And so this is an example of the model performance for site three. Um, results are fairly good. I mean, absolute error of 1.1 for calibration and uh, 1.4 degrees Celsius over the validation period. And as you can see, the the model, the simulated stream temperature, uh, can catch fairly well seasonal and daily fluctuation, which are the, the black dots. This is another way to see the results. To look at the results, we have temperature observation uh, on the x-axis and temperature, temperature simulations on the y-axis. And um, so a perfect match would be dots on the line, one one line. Uh, R square is about 0 0.98, 0 0.97, and the, bi the bias is minus range between minus six and minus minus eight percent, meaning that the model tend overall to underestimate uh, temperature observation. So this is like the final slide where we try to answer the the initial question. So we have the in the x-axis, uh, we have the three configuration hydrological model configurations. On the y-axis, we have the mean absolute error, and each blue dot represents a single uh, stream temperature simulation, basically. And so the variability uh, that we see laterally is due to the hydrological model configuration. And the vertical variability instead is due to the stream temperature model parameters. And so what this aims to do the temperature model parameters are much higher, much larger than the variability due to hydrological model configurations, which is very negligible for the best uh, performing models. And if we consider the median, which is the black lines, which is the black line, uh, it's about 0.1 degrees Celsius, so very kind of irrelevant. 
So in conclusion, the take home message uh, is that uh, our results seem to justify the use of a single hydrological model configurations to force stream temperature model. Although these results we think is uh, constrained for, uh, is only valid for um, this type of resolution. So medium large scale models at daily stream temperature at, at daily time scales. And we don't think it's, it's, it's kind of true for, uh, for shorter time scales, for example. And so that's all for me. And um, if you have any questions, thanks for. Great. Thanks, Luca. And again, thanks for staying up so late. Um, we're, we're taking this uh, later in the day. Um, so, uh, yeah, if there's any questions, put them in the chat and we'll probably roll around at the end to, to, to a couple of questions. There's one for. Uh, um, for Walter here that, that we'll ask at the end. So um, we'll just move on to the next talk and ask the panelists to maybe um, stick around for a couple of questions at the end. Um, okay. So uh, next speaker, um, again, along these, uh, this theme of, um, of uh, sort of advances in modeling, uh, we'll talk, uh, we'll hear from um, Diogo Costa with Environment Climate Change Canada on his uh, his view of the next generation of water quality models. So Costa, the floor is yours. Diogo, your floor is yours. Okay, can you see my, can you see my screen? Yeah, put it in presentation mode. We should be yeah, there. yeah. All right, yes. So um, the title is uh, Towards Next Generation Water Quality Models. Uh, and then uh, the vision is through the coupling of flexible hydro biogeochemical frameworks. So there are two components, the, the biogeochemistry, two well-established cold regions hydrological models. So I'll break down this title a little bit as I go through the presentation uh, because there are two, two very important aspects here. And when I mention next generation, uh, I think it's uh, important to highlight that, um, you know, science modeling and com computer science itself evolves over over the years so it's important that um, every every uh, five to six seven years let's say we we look back and we we re restructure these codes uh, to follow a more um, uh, updated and more um, uh, modern um, uh, approach in terms of computer science so um, some of the people that have uh, been involved in this uh, include myself, uh, uh, Al, Chris Pence from Environment Canada, John Pomeroy, Mark Clark, Martin Clark, and uh, um, Ray Spiteri. So the first thing I want to mention is, um, is the outline and how I'm breaking this down. So the first piece here is the, you know, highlighting some of the challenges in terms of uh, background hydrology. So we need the hydrology for water quality modeling. Uh, it will, will provide the physical transport of the chemical constituents. So that's a very critical uh, piece. And within this, uh, this area, I'll, I'll, I'll compare some of popular models, highlight some of the, of the challenges and the, the pathway that uh, we are using to address some of those. And then I'll, I'll jump into the biogeochemistry side of, of these models and comparing the pop, some popular models and how uh, I'm, I'm looking to uh, addressing those issues. And then I'll, um, I'll finalize with some remarks on, on the vision here. So many of you have probably seen uh, this, um, this, this uh, uh, image. Um, uh, and the point here is that um, there are challenges in the hydrology of popular catchment scale uh, nutrient models. So here on the right side, I have uh, the legend uh, popular models. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. Um, and then we, what we looked here was to assess uh, what is the, the hydrology that they are, um, they are computing. And, and so you can see, uh, you know, all of them account for the, the basic things uh, related to, to cold regions hydrology, including snow accumulation, snowfall. So this is the way you interpret. So this is the process. You just look all the way down here. Uh, through this slice and you see the colors that correspond to the models here. So you can see snowfall is represented by all models, uh, soil temperature, uh, snow melt. So these are the basic um, uh, uh, aspects related to cold regions hydrology. And that's the reason why they were selected for this comparison study. But then when you look at other processes such as wind redistribution of snow, none of them uh, accounts for this. 
uh, runoff infiltration in frozen soils, which is critical for uh, erosion, um, uh, for example, uh, during the, the, the spring freshet, it's ignored for, by most of the models. Uh, and so, for example, rain on snow as well. So there are some challenges here. And, and um, so I think one of the issues here is that all of these systems are being developed completely um, detached and coordinated with the hydrological community. So it seems like it's a completely independent uh, effort. So we need to develop these hydrological systems within our water quality models. And so that creates you know, two challenges. It's the hydrology plus the chemistry. So the approach to, to, to look into this um, is to, you know, the first, this is some of the recent advances in, in, in looking into the transport components. So we are not looking at the biogeochemistry, we're just looking at the, at the transport piece. And so one of the areas that is highly neglected by all of those models is snow chemistry. And so we, we started looking into that. There was a model with developed called Pulse. It's coupled to CRIM, the cold regions hydrological model, as well as snowpack. And we tested this to a number of case studies, um, including in Canada, in North America, in the United States, in Svalbard. And uh, you can see some of the simulations here. I can just walk uh, through this quickly. Uh, this is snow, snow melt concentration. So the, the, the quality, uh, the concentration of, the, of, of, the, of melt water as it exits the snowpack, the concentrations are here. This is time uh, in hours. And you can see that it's characterized usually by an initial pulse, and then you can have a second pulse as well. Uh, and this has to do with the process called snow iron exclusion. So the model is capturing the, that transport process uh, quite well. Um, uh, and then these are the concentrations in the snowpack itself. So this is the depth of the snowpack, and this is time. And the dots correspond to observations. And in the background, we have the model simulation. So I think we did very good progress in terms of, uh, of snow chemistry. Uh, and this is an ongoing work. Another area that we've been uh, tackling, uh, again, on the transport component uh, of, uh, of, of these models is fluxes. Uh, and this is particularly to capture, try to represent some of these problems related to to variable contributing areas in the prairies uh, that then affects connectivity, both hydrological and biogeochemical. Uh, and of course, this has impact on the predominant transport pathways, which is uh, particularly important for uh, discussing uh, the effectiveness of beneficial management practices. And so these are so just some of the results, just to, to give you an idea about uh, looking at uh, the South Tobacco Creek here, uh, looking at the predominant transport pathways. So this is where uh, most of the of the chemical constituents in the soil are, are uh, uh, mobilized and move through the the, the the stream network, and then we can come up with some 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 interesting analysis of of connectivity, hydrological and biogeochemical. Uh, in this case here, this is Saint Denis, which is another uh, very challenging area to simulate with all these path holes and. Uh, um, and defined river networks, uh, and the model can uh, can address that. So this is solving the the shallow water equations at at catchment scales. Uh, another advance in the transport again. So this is mostly focused on transport. Is uh, linking uh, nitrogen and phosphorus modules in the cold region hydrological model, and this is uh, uh, quite interesting because we are trying to here advance. The, 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 the predictability of these flashy systems, uh, as you can see, they are very flashy um, um, and, and they are extremely difficult to, to simulate uh, in terms of uh, the timing the, and the magnitude. So I think we did some, some good progress here. Uh, we implemented this framework for nitrogen, uh, uh, which accounts for a number of chemical species, mineral and organic. Uh, fertilizer input, atmospheric deposition, plant uh, residue, and all of these chemical transformations, um, and as well for uh, uh, phosphorus cycling in, uh, in, in cream. So we are here trying to, to, to validate the model against two hydrological variables and four water quality variables. So I think it's, it's also a, a very um, challenging, challenging uh, um, um, objective trying to have all of these uh, uh, variables being uh, validated and tested. Now, if we look at the biogeochemistry, 
comparing again oh, these popular models that I mentioned before, um, we 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 can see that um, they 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 represent uh, different chemical species in, in different ways. So we have here mineral, organic, uh, hype uh, lumps, all the mineral components, nitrate and ammonia in dissolving organic nitrogen. Uh, in terms of the organic, it simulates uh, dissolved orga organic nitrogen, and then lumps uh, fast decaying nitrogen, organic nitrogen and slow decaying nitrogen. Inca, for example, just ignores the organic component. It, it, it deals with it through sinks and sources, so it doesn't explicitly simulate that. So you have a variety of approaches. So once you, if you use the criteria of, the criteria of, of having, okay, I want the best hydrology possible, let's say I'm going to choose uh, Inca because he has the best hydrology possible, then you, you might be limited with the, with the biochemistry that it, it offers in, in, just in, in, in a very general way. So you always have to come up with this compromise uh, and you're not benefiting from uh, the best hydrology possible for, uh, for, for the region. Um, and so what we, we, so the issues that we found was the, are that the reaction networks tend to be implemented in models. Uh, they are hard coded and static and they tend to be deeply embedded in the code. So it's very difficult to actually debug them, uh, to, to, to make them module, to, to, to extract them from the, the, the ideological code. Um, and then they depend as well on the initial motivation of the model developers. As you could see, they are designed in different ways. Uh, so you, you have to accept them or not. That, that's that's the you don't have, you don't have much choice. Uh, you, we cannot easily change them, uh, and they might not reflect dominant processes. Dominant processes needed. And as well, um, we might have challenges with uh, validating those models uh, if they are very complex. For example, if we don't have the data necessary. So you, I'm just showing here some print screens of. Uh, uh, some biogeochemical frameworks implemented. This is the one implemented in, in SWOT for nitrogen and phosphorus, which is actually quite similar to the one that I implemented in CRIM. But you have here uh, some approaches that can be a lot more uh, uh, complex, uh, uh, dealing with election donors and, and acceptors, uh, such as MyLake, uh, Inc. as well. And so you have all, all of this uh, uh, um, spectrum of, of, uh, of frameworks that are Im implemented. So what we want to address are exactly those, those issues. So each model uses their own conceptual model, which can be simple, others can be more complex and requiring a lot of data, others will require less, uh, but it's a fixed conceptual model, that I, like I mentioned before. And often we, when we try to model uh, and deal with field scientists, uh, uh, we, we, we realize that they, they have a deep knowledge of how these processes should be represented. Uh, and, and so, but because we have a framework that is completely uh, 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 static, we can't, can't change it. It becomes uh, often a problem of communication and, and also trust in the modeling exercise. So we want to address that as well. Uh, and also we, you know, if we, if we, if we think that it's, it's important to represent more, more species, more biogeochemical cycles at the same time, uh, if we select one of those tools, we will be limited uh, by what that, that tool offers. So what we want to do is to uh, develop something that is flexible in terms of, of reaction networks. So the idea is just we can simulate something that is, uh, we can design a, a framework and they can we draw, redraw, improve and adjust and easily being able to, to, to simulate that. Uh, it works in, in a, you know, it's, it's a very similar rationale as the, the a previous speaker talking about the workflows, it's, it's actually a very similar to, to that, uh, uh, those, 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 those lines of thought. So what we developed was a model called, called OpenM and WQ, uh, where we can design these, these biogeochemical conceptual frameworks. And I'm just providing some technical information here, which is not really important. But basically, it's just to say that we, we use a, a, a file a type called GraphML, which can be edited in any uh, in, in a number of um, free free software editors um, and i'm just going to show you here how this looks like um, you can just download this yed um, so Diogo, we, will, we will have to wrap up so. yeah yeah sure sure so it's very easy just start designing it um, and then create the, the framework and then you have a number of supporting scripts that will allow you to implement this in the in the model 
Okay, so the idea here is to tackle the transport component by coupling the model to well-established hydrological models such as Scream, SUMA, and CHM, and basically have a coupler and wrapper here uh, linking the two models. And in terms of bio the biogeochemistry uh, simulations, having then this OpenWQ that allows for flexible design of these frameworks. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. Thanks, Diego. So yeah, that's very exciting. And, and I think it ties in well with a couple of the other hydrology talks. So this is really moving the yardsticks for, uh, for core modeling. So that's great work. Thanks, Diego. And remind people they can ask uh, questions on the Q&A, so feel free to do that, um, and we'll go to the next speaker right away here. So um, the next uh, speaker is talking about nitrogen legacy, and Kimberly Van Meter from the University of Illinois at Chicago. The floor is yours, please. Thank you. Yeah, let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. And I guess I, I tricked you a little bit. I am uh, talking about water quality here, but I'm going to give you a little bit more of a phosphorus focus today. Um, and this is work that was started when I was at the University of Waterloo um, in line with some of the Lake Futures work happening there. And uh, this is in collaboration with Philippe Van Capellen and Nandita Basu um, at University of Waterloo. So this work is really motivated by um, developing tools about how to improve water quality and how can we uh, create better models to answer questions about how do we improve water quality. And uh, this particular project was very much focused on goals associated with reducing phosphorus loading to Lake Erie. And uh, of course, this is uh, an area where we've had a lot of re-eutrophication happening. And we're also very aware that uh, we've been putting a lot of money and energy into putting in uh, new management practices on the landscape here. But we haven't, in many cases, seen the kind of reductions in phosphorus loads in the rivers that we would like to see. So this work is really coming from a place of saying, what are these phosphorus legacies that we have on the landscape? And how do these phosphorus legacies drive water quality? And with this kind of focus, we can go from questions about how do we improve water quality to saying how long will it take to improve water quality? Um, we may know the right things to do in terms of management practices, but we don't necessarily have the best sense of with the presence of legacy, how long it will take to meet the water quality goals. So really trying to get at what's the role of legacy phosphorus in controlling water quality. Now, people have been thinking about phosphorus legacies for a while, and much of this work comes from a kind of mass balance approach. We've seen a good deal of this in Canada, in other uh, areas. Uh, and the idea is to essentially look at all of the phosphorus inputs to the landscape, whether that be through livestock manure, uh, commercial fertilizer, other sources and then say, how much of that is actually taken up into the crops? How much is coming out in the, in the rivers? What is that surplus of phosphorus, that legacy phosphorus that's accumulating? So there's, there's a decent body of work from this mass balance perspective. And then I would say in more recent years, and thus the title of my talk, we're, we're trying to move beyond the simple mass balance approach to saying, can we model how legacy phosphorus is driving water quality? And uh, as an example, there was a really nice paper that uh, Melissa Motu and others at University of Wisconsin did on a small Wisconsin watershed. And this is a very, uh, I would say complex, um, high parameterized, highly parameterized model, um, a, a fairly rigorous approach to trying to, to uh, quantify the contributions of legacy phosphorus to water quality. 
kind of the on the other side of the spectrum, some work by Michelle McCracken in the Baltic region. And here she used a much simpler kind of empirical approach to try to, again, clarify the role of leg legacy phosphorus in driving water quality. We have developed here a newer uh, modeling approach, a, a model that we call elements, uh, explora exploration of long-term nutrient trajectories. And our element phosphorus model, I would say, is somewhere between the two extremes of these modeling types. Um, we do use mass balance data. We try to take a simplified approach so that we can model over time with limited data sources, but element is also a process-based model and uh, which provides a, a, quite a few benefits, which I hope I can convince you of as I uh, present some of the results we have here. Uh, the element phosphorus model has grown out of work that we have done with nitrogen and nitrogen le legacies. I think kind of our, our highest profile use of our element nitrogen model has been for the Mississippi River Basin in the US where we have tried to predict what is the potential for meeting water quality goals for the Gulf of Mexico, um, which of course the Mississippi drains into. And we've shown that even with extremely aggressive measures to decrease the amount of ni surplus nitrogen added to the watershed, it could take on the order of decades to, 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 to meet the nitrogen that can certainly have a very large effect in terms of timeframes to achieve water quality goals. So let me talk to you a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the element phosphorus model. Um, we start out with modeling source zone dynamics. And in many ways, we, we've borrowed from approaches used uh, with uh, the century model. Um, hype, um, we, we use some similar processes there. Essentially, we're looking at how phosphorus moves through the source zone in terms of an active pool of organic matter, a passive pool, we've got mineral phosphorus, and then we're able to uh, model uh, runoff and erosion as well as leaching to groundwater to the subsurface. Really crucial to this portion of the modeling is development of a phosphorus surplus data set. And we run this model over a period of a couple of hundred years. So it is not trivial to develop these long-term uh, input data sets. So that's a big part of the model development. Um, as I said, we explicitly model runoff and erosion. We take into account explicitly wastewater effluent coming into the river system. For groundwater transport, we use a travel time based approach and these things then come together, allowing us to predict phosphorus trajectories at the catchment outlet and to take into account the kind of time lags that would occur um, with these sometimes these long transport pathways and with the development of legacy phosphorus within the soil zone in riparian areas, et cetera. Okay, so that is our modeling framework here. Um, we, in this work that I'm presenting here, we focused on the Grand River watershed. And I think Luca gave kind of a nice uh, introduction to the Grand River in his talk. And one of the things that's interesting about modeling here over this long time period, as you can see here, we've got pretty significant changes in land use, um, decreases in the amount of agricultural land, but very large increases in population density over this period. So very much changing human impacts as we go along. In the model, we pay very close uh, attention to domestic phosphorus sources because human waste and detergent phosphorus, particularly uh, from the 70s up until you know several decades there where there was not really sufficient um, 
regulation of phosphorus in dish detergents and laundry detergents. So all of this is taken into account here. And you can see here with some of our results, this kind of peak in, in detergent phosphorus that occurred in the 70s, uh, human uh, waste phosphorus continued to increase over time. But we also here are taking into account treatment levels in the wastewater plants here. So you can see a real peak in wastewater inputs in the 70s and then a decrease later on. Uh, we put this into context of entire watershed phosphorus surplus trajectories where we're taking into account not just that domestic phosphorus waste but also the agricultural inputs here. And I'll show you what just that long input trajectory looks like here. So we see again a peak in surplus magnitudes around 1980 and a bit of a decreasing trajectory then. So our question is, how does this relate to what we see in terms of riverine phosphorus trajectories here? So here I show some of our modeled results. You can see here our model predictions and uncertainty bounds in the black and actual measured loads in red here. And we're able to show how we have decreased loads here, but are still well above the baseline levels that we would have seen prior to about 1940. Now, one of the more interesting things that our modeling approach can do is show where legacy phosphorus has been accumulating within the watershed. And not surprisingly, we see see largest accumulation amounts in soil. We also see accumulation in landfill, relatively small amounts in groundwater. Um, so interesting here, you can see, if you look at the total surplus magnitudes are, and uh, in terms of what's then been released to the river, we see only 4% of those net inputs have been exported to downstream waters. So the, the watershed itself is a very strong filter. The soil is a very strong filter. Uh, one of the things that we've been interested in is reservoirs and riparian zones. We're able to um, predict accumulation here um, this is kind of synergistic with some other work where we're actually taking sediment cores in the reservoirs to try to quantify surplus phosphorus accumulation there. And uh, our, our measured results suggest that we've got about, in these Grand River reservoirs, about 35 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare of upstream area that's been accumulating over time. And we found that our model does a reasonably good job of predicting that accumulation there. So thinking of kind of the future where we're asking how long will it take water quality to improve and thinking about these 40% reduction goals that we have for, uh, for Lake Erie, we've done some forward simulations. And here is where you really see the legacy effects. We show that under a business as usual scenario, we can actually expect about a 12% increase in phosphorus loading over the next uh, 20 years or so, um, just due to continued inputs from that legacy phosphorus. We tested increasing our phosphorus use efficiency from the 63% where it's at now up to 95%. And even then we still see a small increase in phosphorus loading. So due to those legacy effects, even pretty drastic um, improvements in reducing the surplus don't do a lot in terms of reducing those phosphorus loads from the watershed. Uh, we did find, however, that improving manure handling could make a, a very large an impact and a pretty fast impact on phosphorus loading. Here we show about a 16% decrease and then applying kind of a, a suite of different approaches from improving that manure handling to 
uh, further improvements in wastewater treatment removal, decreasing erosion. There are ways to put, put practices together to meet the water quality goals. So in next steps, we are applying this model more generally around uh, watersheds all around uh, Lake Erie. We're trying to take into account uh, more explicitly the effects of reservoirs and wetlands and the phosphorus uh, legacies associated with those. We are integrating uh, these reservoir nutrient legacies into the element modeling framework and doing more uh, um, explicit uh, modeling of phosphorus uh, dynamics within some of the Grand River reservoirs. And with that, I will finish up. Great, thanks very much, Kimberly. That's really uh, insightful and interesting. Some of us really never heard the term legacy phosphorus until GWF. So this has been great for those of us who are kind of on the fringes of some of this stuff. So wonderful okay, talk. Great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and I think we have one last speaker. Uh, just double checking here. So Philippe, hopefully you could join us. There we go. And uh, yeah, so Philippe's going to talk to us about lake nutrient cycling and algal production. Um, so Philippe, the floor is yours and this will be the last talk. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Just put in a presentation. We could. Thank you. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to maybe present three different modeling approaches to address uh, nutrient cycling and algal growth in large lakes. And of course, that is work that's motivated by the uh, problems that nutrient enrichment of large lakes are causing, so eutrophication. Uh, and that's affecting, of course, our uh, lower uh, Laurentian Great Lakes, but also some of the other lakes in, in Canada and certainly also around the world. So the simplest, let me see, I can move. Oops, I'm having problems moving forward. So <clears throat> the simplest approach, both conceptually and numerically, is just to build a mass balance model, in this case for phosphorus, uh, because it's considered to be the limiting nutrient for uh, primary production. In, in lakes. And so I'll illustrate this for Lake Erie. So to develop a model like that, of course, you need to know what the phosphorus inputs are to the lake. Uh, and so uh, you also need to, of course, take into account the lake morphometry, because that is to a large extent related to water circulation, but also the, uh, the bathymetry is an important aspect in terms of uh, stratification of the lake, which then, of course, influences vertical mixing. And sedimentation is very important because that's the ultimate way by which a lake can essentially remove phosphorus by burying it into the sediments. So if we take Lake Erie, it consists of three distinct basins, the Western Basin, the Central Basin, and the Eastern Basin. But if you look at the lower figure, uh, and particularly if you take the panel A of the lower figure, you can see, for instance, for the central basin that the, you have these very high suspended matter concentrations that are hugging the, the shoreline. And there's a lot of a long shore transport in, in Lake Erie. So we also have to take into account the difference between the offshore water masses and the, uh, literal, the literal zones. And so what I'll do now is to show you the uh, annual phosphorus cycle that we've developed, an average annual phosphorus cycle and it's an average representative of the period uh, 2005 to 2016. So the question is always when you build a model like this is how simple can you go and still make meaningful interference inferences. So I've already told you there we have three basins, the Western Basin, the Central Basin and the Eastern Basin. And for the Central and the Eastern Basin, we also have to distinguish between the offshore waters and the littoral zones. Now for the Northern Basin, we also have to break down the, for the Eastern Basin, the Northern littoral zone into two parts based on uh, the, the distinct hydrodynamics in these two zones. So it means that essentially we end up with 10 water column reservoirs. And so the question is now, if we know how phosphorus is entering the lake, then how is then being redistributed among these 10 water column reservoirs? And so that very much depends on the uh, circulation, the water circulation. So the first thing we have to build then is an annual uh, water cycle, which represents the net flows of water between these different, these 10 different compartments. And so if you look at the, um, at the, uh, at this picture here, without going too much into the detail, uh, you can see, for instance, that if you look at the, at the flow of water from the western basin to the central basin, 
about half of it is direct transfer to the offshore waters, and then the other half is more or less equally uh, flowing into the northern and southern littoral zones. Uh, transfer of water from the central basin to the eastern basin is uh, along the shorelines again, and there's actually a return flow from the offshore eastern basin to the, the, to the central basin. So you can see that we have fairly already at this level, we can see that we have quite a complex uh, water cycle. Uh, again, if you take, for instance, the central basin, you see that, uh, that the offshore reservoir, there's a net flow of water from the offshore reservoir towards the littoral zone through upwelling events. But in the, uh, in the eastern basin, it's the opposite. The uh, net flow of water is actually from the littoral zone into the offshore waters. And so if you then look at the, in this case, the total phosphorus cycle, uh, you see that it inherits a lot of the characteristics of the water cycle. Uh, and in particular, you see that the uh, a long short transport or the transport between littoral zone to littoral zone, uh, those, are the very, that those are some of the most important fluxes that you see here. What you also see, for instance, in the central basin is that the offshore is a source of phosphorus for the littoral zone. So these upwelling events uh, that happen are bringing phosphorus from the deeper part of the central basin and bringing it to the littoral zone. Uh, the opposite is true for the, uh, for the northern um, uh, littoral zone in the eastern basin, which is actually a net source of phosphorus for the, uh, for the offshore waters. So what you get here is kind of this average, long-term, very broad scale uh, picture of how phosphorus entering the lake is basically being redistributed. Now, um, Kim just talked about these reduction scenarios, so reducing essentially the phosphorus inputs to the lake. With this uh, kind of mass balance uh, modeling approach, we can then see how at least on the longer term, so on the yearly to decade or to century, uh, century time scales, these reduction uh, scenarios then translate into uh, changes in the, uh, in the redistribution of phosphorus in the lake and also in the lake phosphorus uh, levels. But that doesn't give you much insight into the processes that are really uh, controlling the cycling of phosphorus in the lake itself. So that, for that, you have to go to more sophisticated modeling uh, tools. And in particular, what you can then do is to have a more detailed representation of the ecosystem processes and that link that to uh, the hydrodynamics in the system. So I wanna illustrate this for Lake St. Clair. So that's that body of water that's in between Lake Huron and, uh, and uh, Lake Erie. So it receives water from Lake Huron to the so-called St. Clair River, which is really a connecting channel. And it discharges water into the Western basin of Lake Erie via the Detroit River, which is also a connecting uh, channel. And there's of course also a bunch of tributaries, both on the Canadian and the US side that also bring in water and in this case also nutrients into Lake St. Clair. So we use this model LCOM KDM. So it's uh, essentially a coupling of uh, 3D hydrodynamics model to an ecosystem model where we have the various processes representing nutrient cycling, but also the phytoplankton dynamics. And so the results are we focused on this year 2009. And essentially one of the questions we wanna ask ourselves is of all the phosphorus entering Lake St. Clair in 2009, how much of it actually stays in the lake? How much is retained in the lake? accumulation in the sediments versus how much is then transferred to the Detroit River and ultimately to Lake Erie. And so what we find for this particular uh, system is that resuspension deposition plays a big role in, in the phosphorus retention. And that's because it's a fairly shallow uh, lake. It also tells you that we can expect because resuspension deposition is very much then wind related to the wind strength and the wind direction, that we are expecting very big differences from year to year because we have years when we have very strong winds and years which we have less winds. But for 2009, we find significant retention of phosphorus in Lake St. Clair. 17% of the total phosphorus entering the lake is actually retained in the lake. And for uh, soluble reactive phosphorus, so the more bioavailable fraction, it's actually 35%. What we can also do with a model like this, we of course did, is to ask the question, well, if you look at all the phosphorus atoms that are flowing uh, from the lake into uh, the Detroit River and makes it to uh, the, uh, the Lake Erie, how, much of these, how many of these atoms are actually coming from the different tributaries? How many of these atoms are actually coming from Lake Huron? You can't do that experimentally because you can't distinguish these phosphorus atoms, but with the model, you can actually do that. And we find, for instance, that the different tributaries um, the, the tributary phosphorus loads are retained differently. Uh, uh, and in fact, the tributary loads are more efficiently retained than the phosphorus load from Lake Huron. So a lot of the phosphorus entering uh, uh, 
the Western Basin of Lake Erie actually is coming or are coming from uh, Lake Huron. Okay, but the problem, let me go back to this. The, the, the issue, of course, with these models is that it represents has a very detailed representation of processes. But as Diogo also touched upon in his talk, I mean, uh, first of all, in these, in these models that are fairly, the process are fairly fixed. So you have to assume that all the models that are in your, all the processes that are in your model are the ones that are actually relevant. And also that, they're, that the representation of these models, of these processes, sorry, that the representations are included in these models of these processes are adequate for your purposes. So there's a lot of model structure uncertainty and model parameter uncertainty that accompany these types of uh, mechanistic models. So a third, an alternative approach to say, well, let's forget about, or let's make no assumption about how the system works. Let's just have a fully data-driven uh, approach. And so we've done this for Lake Erie, for the three basins separately and for Lake Ontario. And essentially we look at as response variable, the surface water chlorophyll A, because we can derive this from satellite data so we can get these relatively long time series, high resolution time series chlorophyll A uh, uh, data series. And so the question we were really asking is, well, uh, we know that there is a lot of uh, inter and intra uh, annual variability also in the hydrometeorology of these lakes. To what extent can we link changes in the response variable, changes in the chlorophyll A concentrations to changes in these hydrometeorological parameters and or variables? And they're, they're listed here in the, in the box here. So surface water temperature, watershed land surface temperature, precipitation, cloud cover evaporation, runoff, wind speed, wind direction, maximum ice extent, the ice duration, and the tributary inflows. And so essentially what you do is now an optimization exercise where you try to derive the optimal algorithm that allows you to predict the chlorophyll A concentration based on these uh, various variables. Now we know that, for instance, if you look at the ice cover, it varies a lot from year to year. If you look at the temperature distribution, it also varies a lot from year to year, it varies a lot within a single year. So here, for instance, if you look at the lower uh, right-hand side, what you see here are the chlorophyll A concentrations from 2002 to 2016, the dots are the uh, or the observe, observed data for Lake Erie. And the black line is actually one of these uh, machine learning algorithms that is essentially predicting the chlorophyll A concentration. Just visually, you can see that we do a very good job uh, with that. Now, without going into the details, we did several, we used several machine learning models, adaptive boosting, extreme gradient boosting, et cetera. And, but the, the principle is always the same. You take a portion of your data and you use that data to train your algorithm, to train your model, and then you use the rest of the data for testing. And what we find is that for the three basins of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, 90% of the chlorophyll A variability can be explained by variations or variability in surface lake temperature, watershed lake uh, land temperature, river inflow, evaporation, ice duration. So these are all variables that are very much climate related. And in particular, the, well, also the surface lake temperature and the watershed land temperature are very strong, strongly correlated. So now you can take your algorithm and make a prediction towards the future and say, okay, well, if we know, if we we'll have certain scenarios of how, say, the, the, the surface lake temperature will vary into the future, how ice duration might decrease into the future, if you build that into your, of, impose that to your algorithm, then indeed we see that chlorophyll A concentration should actually start increasing uh, with, uh, with uh, the predicted uh, global, uh, global or local, I should say, regional uh, climate change. So what we see here is that indeed there is a climate driver of the uh, chlorophyll A concentration and probably also of the eutrophication in general. Okay, so I presented three different modeling approaches. They differ in their complexity, they differ in their temporal and spatial resolution, they differ in their data demands but they're all complementary in the sense that they allow you to answer different questions. So for instance, if you're looking at the impact of long-term phosphorus input reductions, then the mass balance phosphorus model will allow you to give an average response in terms of what might happen to, for, for instance, the phosphorus concentrations in the different portions of the lake. If it's about diagnosing the relative importance of different processes or forcings, then the coupled hydrodynamics ecosystem model is probably the more relevant one. And if you want to forecast variations, alcohol abundance at a relatively short uh, time scale, so interannual, seasonal to monthly, then the machine learning model will be the, the, I would say, the more appropriate approach. So I'd like to thank then Zara, who worked on the phosphorus mass balance model, Sergey, who worked on the ecosystem modeling of Lake St. Clair, and Homa, 
who did the machine learning modeling of the algorithm amendments. And that's it. Super. Thanks, Philippe. That was great. I uh, really appreciate that talk. And um, if you have questions for Philippe, given that he's the last speaker, maybe you can just ask them directly at this point rather than go through um, the Q&A. And I'd like to thank all the other speakers for uh, answering all the Q&A questions. That's greatly appreciated. So any quick questions for Philippe? Okay, I, I don't see any questions, so I can't see everybody, of course, but um, okay. So so I think um, with that, I just a uh, couple of closing remarks. Um, one, it's, it's great to see the sort of the marriage, I guess, if you like, of the water quality and hydrology folks um, in this work and, um, you know, the importance of bringing things together. I'm really intrigued by um, the way all the communities are thinking about um, sort of model agnostic frameworks and moving things forward and and uh, really sort of tying, tying the two disciplines together. So that's really encouraging. And, and probably, Philippe, we could argue that that's uh, one of the major outcomes of Global Water Futures is bringing these these communities together um, in kind of a new and, and novel way. So so I, I think we've made some great strides and progress on, on that front. So, so kudos to everybody. Um, who gave the talks today and uh, who are seeing the larger vision here about, about maybe bringing the communities closer together over time. So, so that's great. Um, and uh, um, I think uh, with that, I don't uh, know if there's any last minute comments, Philippe, as the co-convener, would you like to say a few words at the end? I think you said very well. It's, um... Uh, it's really to see where the connections are, where the strengths lie for different uh, modeling approaches, different modelers also, uh, and try to really kind of um, see how we can speak to, to one another. Uh, and I think always, always to think about, we don't develop models for the pleasure of developing models, although we do get pleasure out of it, but it's really what, what are the questions that we're trying to answer? What are the what are the, the, the big issues? And, and, and clearly, I think that's that came out very well in this session today. Yeah, great. great. Okay, so once again, I'd like to thank all the speakers for, for uh, taking the time to, to be with us today and, and the great presentations and uh, look forward to upcoming results and look forward to meeting everybody um, face to face one day, which would be nice. So, okay, take care, everybody. I think with that, uh, Pravin, any last minute logistics or are we good to close off the meeting? Yeah, we are good to close up the meeting. Thanks, Alan. Okay. So take care, everybody. Stay safe and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of the G GWF conference. Thanks, Pravin, especially for all your hard work in pulling this together. Much appreciated. Take care, everybody. Bye.